Hello students, Dr. Lyons here, uh, and in this chapter we're going to talk a little bit about plants and where they came from, and a little bit about fungi and where they came from. Uh, we're not going to get into a huge amount of detail in plants and on plants and fungi in this chapter, uh, because you're going to see be seeing a lot of that in in the lab or in the virtual lab. Uh, but but we'll be doing just kind of like a, a brief overview of where these things came from and a little bit more about them. Uh, so first of all, this picture here, this is one of my favorite types of plants. So this is a, a Joshua tree. And you can probably guess I took this picture out in Joshua Tree National Park. Okay, so first we'll cover plants. Uh, and before we do that, uh, I want to get you excited about plants because oftentimes we kind of think, oh, plants boring. Uh, at least that is the uh, that is the mindset that I often have because I'm definitely more of an animal enthusiast. Uh, but plants are important and do some pretty cool things. So plants are, of course, crucially important to us. Uh, most importantly to us, they create oxygen, right? So that's why I should all thank a plant today, uh, because a lot of the oxygen in the atmosphere comes from plants. Uh, and in a lot of the things that we eat are plants, or or we eat things that eat plants. Uh, so plants are, of course, crucially important uh, to, to us, uh, which I don't think you need any reminding of at this point. Plants also do some pretty cool things. So even though uh, even though that they you know they just sit there, they can do some pretty crazy stuff. So for instance, this plant that you see here on the left. Uh, this is what's known as a corpse plant, and it's called that because it smells like a corpse. Uh, and the reason why it smells like a corpse is because it has a very uncommon way of reproducing. So as, as a lot of you know, so how a lot of plants reproduce is they attract insects, uh, bees, and things like that. Uh, and those bees then grab pollen from one plant and bring it to another. Uh, and, and, that's how, and that's how the DNA from one plant is, is exchanged with, with DNA from another plant. Uh, what this plant does uh, is it attracts flies uh, because flies are, you know, of course, attracted to rotting meat. Uh, and so this plant smells like, like rotting meat, which is why flies will be attracted to it. Uh, so that's the corpse plant. This thing that is on the on the right is what's known as a watery hammer orchid, uh, and this plant does something equally crazy. So it, uh, in order to reproduce, uses bees. Uh, but whereas most plants use bees uh, by attracting them with uh, with some sort of sweet nectar or some sort of reward uh, that then brings them in, what the watery hammer orchid does is it mimics a female bee. So to a male bee, this apparently looks like a female bee. So a male bee, you know, is flying by, sees this thing, it says, it says, oh boy, uh, and it gets really aroused and then goes and tries to mate with this pretend female bee, uh, only to realize, oh, I've been duped. It's not actually a female bee. It's a part of this plant. And then that same male bee, you know, flies off and 30 seconds later, it sees another one and says, hey, there's another one. And then it tries to reproduce with that pretend female bee, only to discover Oh man, I've been duped once again. I am so stupid. Uh, and so that's how this plant reproduces. It, it tricks male, it tricks horny male bees into trying to reproduce with it. Uh, so that's how they do it. Uh, so plants can do some pretty neat things, right? Even though they are, you know, stuck in place, uh, there are some pretty neat things about them. There are even some plants that can eat you. Uh, or not necessarily you, but if you were a small insect, then they might eat you. So I think a lot of you are familiar with this thing on the right. This is a Venus flytrap, right? If you're a small fly and you touch one of these little spiky things, then the, then the trap closes uh, and crushes the, the poor little insect, uh, which then is digested and the nutrients of which then go into the Venus flytrap. Uh, this thing over here, a little less uh, uh, well known, uh, this is what's known as a pitcher plant. Uh, there is, uh, on the, the, the rim of this pitcher plant, there is sugar and it's uh, very, very slick, very slippery. Uh, the inside of the walls of this pitcher plant are very slick. Uh, and at the bottom is water, uh, along with digestive juices. So a insect will land on the, the edge here, uh, and it will, will try to, uh, you know, for, to try to get the sugar, uh, 
only to slip and fall inside in which it can't get out. So then it gets slowly digested uh, inside of the, the, the digestive compounds inside the liquid inside this plant. Uh, and then the plant absorbs the nutrients from, uh, from that insect. So some plants can even actually eat things. Uh, not quite in the same way that we eat things, but they, they can eat things. So let's talk about how plants came to be, like how they, how they evolved. Uh, so the, first of all, the ancestors of plants are green algae. So green algae are one of the types of protists. So in the, in the last chapter, chapter 15, we talked about eukaryotes and single-celled eukaryotes. Uh, and then there are also multicellular uh, eukaryotes, uh, multicellular protists uh, in the form of algae. And so green algae, such as this stuff that you see here, uh, gave rise to all of the plants that we have living on land. So one lineage of green algae essentially moved up onto land and evolved uh, the use of land. Uh, this is about 50 million, 500 million years ago. Uh, and there were some benefits to doing this. So up on land, there's more sunlight because when, when sunlight goes through water, it gets filtered out. So there's less of it the deeper you go. So there's more sunlight on land, there's plenty of carbon dioxide. And for those early, those first plants that moved up onto land, the really key thing is that there weren't any herbivores there because there weren't any animals on land yet. So it was an enemy free zone. There was no animals up there uh, to eat them. Uh, so that would have been a huge benefit to moving up on land, uh, which is you know why they why they did it. However, there was also some challenges for those first very early plants, right? So, so one challenge is drying out. So green algae that live in the ocean, they don't have to worry about drying out because they are submerged in water. Uh, so, so those early first plants had to evolve structures to prevent themselves from drying out now that they were in air. And we'll talk about what they, what they you know, did in order to do that. Uh, another issue that they had to cope with is, is the fact that algae, so green algae don't have rigid structures. They don't have many rigid structures, uh, which is fine for them because they live in a zero gravity environment underwater. However, plants that live on land, including those first early plants that were on land, they had to deal with gravity, right? Because they're out in the air. So rigid structures would have needed to have form uh, in, uh, in those early first plants in order for them to survive uh, up on land. Okay, uh, another key issue would have been reproduction. So the sperm of algae swims through water, but sperm cannot swim through air, right? It would be pretty, pretty terrifying and disgusting if it could swim through air, but it can't. So essentially those early first plants had to evolve ways of, of reproducing without the benefit of water that algae can swim in. Uh, and finally, another one last kind of major challenge is that uh, is that algae get their nutrients from water. Uh, and so there's nutrients dissolved in the water around them. And so they can just absorb nutrients through their skin. Uh, however, that's not that's not available to plants that are on land. Uh, so plants that are on land, uh, there's not nutrients just floating in the air around them. So they had to come up with a new way of getting uh, getting those essential nutrients that they that they need. Okay, so let's talk about how they how early plants dealt with all of those challenges that I that I just discussed. Right, so we talked about how drying out would have been an issue for those first early plants. Uh, and so what plants evolved was what's known as a cuticle. Right, so if you feel uh, this the if you feel the top and bottom of a leaf, you'll feel that it has kind of a papery sort of waxy texture to it. Uh, that's because plants have a cuticle that uh, that is really good at at preventing moisture loss, which is why it feels kind of papery. Uh, and how they they deal with uh, and how they prevent water from being lost uh, is that when they do have to exchange gases, so bring in carbon dioxide and exhale CO and exhale uh, oxygen, uh, what they do is they have stomata, which are these small holes, and those small holes are on the bottoms of leaves. Uh, and that's important because the bottom of the leaf gets less hot than the top of the leaf, which means that it's harder for water to, to evaporate out of the stomata uh, with them being on the bottom as opposed to the, to the top. 
So those were the, the adaptations that they evolved for, uh, for, for dealing with living in a, in a dry environment. Let's see, how they dealt with uh, water and nutrients is essentially plants on land evolved roots. Uh, and so they use those roots in order to get water from the ground and to get nutrients that are dissolved in the water that is in the ground. They evolved uh, stomata, not, not just for, for preventing water loss, but also for getting CO2 from the, uh, from the air around them. Uh, and they evolved these mechanisms for moving products around their bodies. Right, so, so they evolved uh, what's known as xylem and phloem for, for dealing with being up on air, uh, up in the air. So xylem transports water through a plant, right? So they take water from their, from their roots and then transport them up to the rest of the plants into the leaves. Uh, and they use their phloem to transport sugars that are made in the leaves down through the, the rest of the plant. Uh, so the xylem and the phloem were major uh, adaptations that allowed plants to then live on on land, right? And uh, and how they've learned how to reproduce on land, or not necessarily learn, but how they evolved to reproduce on land is is using things like pollen, using things like cones, you know, coming up with new ways of of, of reproducing that doesn't require sperm uh, swimming through uh, through through water. Uh, and then in terms of dealing with with the the rigidity issue. Right, so plants live in a in a gravity of environment as opposed to their ancestors. Green algae live in a zero gravity environment. Right, so plants have huge amounts of cellulose uh, in them. Right, the cell walls of plants are made of cellulose, which is rigid. Uh, with, so with those rigid structures, that allows them to stand upright uh, and fight the the effects of of gravity. Okay, so that's all I want to tell you about plants. Uh, you're going to learn a lot more about them in the uh, in the, the plant uh, virtual lab or the or the plant lab. Uh, so now let's talk a little bit about uh, about fungi. Uh, so first of all, fungi, I want to stress to you that they too are important uh, because uh, they are very very important decomposers, right? So we learned about decomposers uh, uh, back in the last chapter because many prokaryotes are in fact decomposers. Uh, and as a reminder, decomposers are things that take dead, take other dead things and break them down and, and eat the sugars inside of those dead things. And they release carbon dioxide back out into the atmosphere that then plants can then take back out of the atmosphere. Uh, so they do a really important job of, of recycling things essentially. Uh, without decomposers such as fungi and, uh, and prokaryotes, uh, the ground will be covered with a lot of dead stuff because there wouldn't be anything to to take those dead things and recycle them uh, back into into CO2 that then plants can take back up. So fungi are very, very important. Uh, fungi also do some pretty neat things. Uh, I'll post this this video uh, that I'm referencing here uh, online, uh, but there are some fungi that are actually kind of manipulative. Uh, they will manipulate insects into doing uh, things that they want. So there's one whole group of fungi that will that will infiltrate the brains of insects in uh, in tropical rainforests. Uh, in those in those insects then behave in ways that help spread uh, the fungi. Uh, but it would be best just to watch the video because that will explain that in, in a lot of better detail. Okay, another way that fungi are useful, uh, in addition to them being incredibly useful uh, decomposers, they're also useful in, in medicine, right? So one of our first uh, antibiotics came from a fungi. So what you see here in this picture is you see penicillium, that is the white thing, so that is a type of fungi. Uh, and this fungi is growing on, on a plate, right? So this, uh, this is what's known a, as a auger uh, plate. Uh, and what you see here, this is a smear of the bacteria Staphylococcus. And you can see in the periphery of this penicillium, the Staphylococcus isn't living right there, right? So that the Staphylococcus has, has died. Uh, and why that is the case is because penicillium produces a compound known as penicillin. Uh, and penicillin it, uh, prevents Staphylococcus from make Staphylococcus and other bacteria uh, penicillin prevents them from making their, their plasma cell membranes. Uh, 
So penicillium, uh, it was discovered by accident that they produced this compound that is useful in, in destroying bacteria such as Staphylococcus. Uh, and penicillin is, of course, still used today, uh, along, along with a lot of other compounds that are related to penicillin. You know, things such as uh, 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 methicillin or, or, or doxycycline or things like that. So fungi are very, very useful to us from a, a medicine perspective. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, about fungi nutrition and fungi uh, anatomy. Uh, and before that, maybe I should just mention briefly a little bit about where fungi uh, came from. All right, so like the plants, uh, fungi also came from protist uh, ancestors. So there is a group of protists that, that act as decomposers, uh, and it's thought that that group of, of protists is what actually gave rise to the, to the fungi. So actually, the, all the, the, the organisms that we're talking about in this lecture, and then we'll talk about in the, the next lecture, the, the animals, all came from protists. So there was a, a, a group of protists that gave rise to plants. So the green algae gave rise to plants. There was a group of protists that were like decomposers that gave rise to fungi. And then there was another group of protists that were kind of animal-like. Uh, and then those gave, like, gave rise to the animals. So protists are, are, uh, are a not very well-known group of living things, but they are important to us because they are our ancestors and they're also the ancestors of, of fungi uh, and of plants. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about fungi nutrition and anatomy. So they are heterotrophic, right? So they have to eat other things, right? So what this fungi is doing is it has all of these threads in the ground and those threads decompose uh, dead matter, dead, like so that the formerly living parts of, of things that are now dead. These fungi here, these are what are known as uh, typically called like shelf fungi, uh, and they are parasites. So they are essentially boring into this tree and parasitizing that tree. Uh, and so how fungi do this, uh, how both of these fungi are doing this, uh, is that they secrete enzymes into the environment around them. So this fungi is secreting enzymes into the ground underneath it. And these shelf fungi are, are uh, releasing uh, enzymes into the tree around it. Uh, and what they do is they digest their food externally. And they need to do it that way because they don't have mouths and they don't have stomachs like we do. So they digest their food outside of them and then just absorb the nutrients from around them just through their, through their skin, essentially. Uh, there are some fungi that some of you might be familiar with. Hopefully not too many of you are familiar with these. Uh, but ringworm is actually a type of, of fungi. So this nasty thing that you see here is, is actually a type of, of fungal uh, infection. Uh, and, uh, and, so the, and so that's why, and so, and so why you find, you tend to find ringworm the most in, in like wrestlers and people that are in contact sports where they're, you know, touching each other's skin a lot. Uh, and ringworm spreads in that way. And that's why it's called ringworm, because it often spreads among athletes that are, you know, competing in, in rings where they're, where they're touching each other a lot. All right, so a lot of fungi are actually very negative towards food production because there are a lot of fungi, for instance, uh, what's known as a ergot, uh, will actually attack crops such as corn and, and grains. Uh, so they'll actually attack fruit and grain crops, uh, which is which is really bad. Uh, and actually, a huge amount of of the fruit and, and grain crops, you know, that are produced per year, actually get attacked and destroyed by by fungi. Okay, so how fungi actually uh, a little bit more about their actual anatomy. So I talked about how they they're kind of thread like. So the main part of a fungus is actually this thread-like thing that is below the surface, this thread-like thing that you don't actually see. So there's this mass of threads that are, and, and all these threads are called hyphae. Uh, and those are, those are the things that are actually producing enzymes and absorbing nutrients from the, from the ground uh, around them. Uh, so that's what the, the hyphae are doing. Uh, then the part that you actually see, the thing that looks like what we call a, a mushroom, is actually a bunch of hyphae that then grow upward 
uh, and they and they have these things underneath them. They have these spore producing structures uh, on the bottom of them. So if you think of a typical mushroom, like a know, like a portobello mushroom, uh, the gill area that's kind of underneath that is where the spores are reproduced. So in fact, the the fungi that that we eat uh, actually like mushrooms that we that we eat is actually the reproductive part of a fungus. Uh, you're not actually eating the main part of the fungus, you're eating just the reproductive part. And the gills that are underneath uh, that mushroom is, is actually what they produce their spores with. Uh, and spores are, are how they, they reproduce. Okay, one kind of noteworthy uh, type of fungi that I wanted to, to mention uh, is what's known as mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, and mycorrhizal fungi, they have a very, very important role on, on the planet. So they form symbiotic relationships with plants. So symbiotic meaning that they live in close association and they're really quite useful to each other. So fungi uh, are very good at absorbing nutrients from the ground around them. You know, because they have those digestive enzymes that they can just release, uh, they're really good at getting nutrients out of the ground. Uh, and so what happens here is that the mycorrhizal fungi will absorb nutrients from the ground, things like nitrate and phosphate and nitrite, uh, and it will give some of those nutrients to the plants because the fungi, they actually kind of grow into the roots of the plant. The plant then in return provides sugars because that's what plants do. They, they create sugars using, uh, using you know, photosynthesis and energy from the sun and they give a bunch of those sugars to their fungi. Uh, and so it's, it's, uh, it's been found that, that roughly 90% of all plants actually do this, right? So a huge amount of the plants that we encounter are relying on mycorrhizal fungi to exist. So if it wasn't for those fungi, then a huge amount of the plants that we rely upon just, just wouldn't exist, they just wouldn't be there. So these fungi are really important because as we know, plants are, are incredibly important to us. Okay, so that's all I want to tell you about plants and fungi. Uh, in the next chapter, we're going to delve into animals.